Good evening, I'm Adrian Arsenault. And I'm Andrew Chang. Tonight, a CBC News exclusive. People have a right to know. An Ontario dentist charged with multiple counts of sexual assault is still taking appointments. His patients kept in the dark. Patient safety is something that always, always has to come first. Only spending $5 billion a year. A man who took his rage to Catherine McKenna's constituency office and shouted obscenities is now being investigated for a hate crime. I want the girls and women out there to think that they can go in and make a difference, but not have to pull it up with this garbage. Mass resignations and grief that goes on and on in Beirut. I blame every person who called them to, uh, to turn off this fire and they knew what, were, what they were in sign and what were, they were at the court. The Lebanese government steps down, calling it the will of the people. And the Canadian innovation that could be a COVID game changer. We could really help people, organization, and make that uh, difference between uh, life and death. The new rapid COVID test and what it might mean for your return to work. This is The National. We begin with the CBC News exclusive about patient safety and your right to know. A Toronto dentist is facing multiple sexual assault and sexual interference charges, but his patients are likely unaware. CBC News has learned the alleged victims include his clients, some of them children. Yet the dentist faces no restrictions on his practice. David Common explains why. There is no warning sign outside this dental office in Toronto's upscale Davisville Village and no requirement for one. The only hint for patients of Dr. Amir Hadarian found on the web page of Ontario's dental regulator. Six weeks ago, on June 26, it notes, the dentist was charged with five counts of assault, four of sexual assault, and four for sexual interference involving a person under 16. Ten days later, on July 6, the Royal College of Dental Surgeons investigator heard the specific allegations. But it took another month before the college convened a panel on what to do. And still, he is free to book appointments with no requirements to even tell patients. People have a right to know. Kerry Bowman is a bioethicist with the University of Toronto. I don't think it's good. I mean, I, I think patient safety has, is something that always, always has to come first. And I think that the duty to warn is both a legal and an ethical construct. The dental regulator now says an investigation is underway with its inquiries, complaints and reports committee and a decision will be released in due course. The dental regulator could temporarily suspend Dr. Hedarian's license, but under Ontario legislation, it has to give him two weeks notice. So even if they acted today, Dr. Hedarian would have been able to see patients unrestricted for eight weeks since he was charged. I think as a patient, I would be quite surprised that this individual who's the subject of criminal charges had been continuing to practice for, for two months. By contrast, were a medical doctor facing similar allegations, the College of Physicians and Surgeons of Ontario says it would be dealt with in a matter of days, not weeks. Dr. Hedarian has not been convicted, nor have the allegations been tested in court. His lawyer says his career is unblemished and he will plead not guilty. Meanwhile, Hedarian's office has continued to take appointments. David Common, CBC News, Toronto. An Alberta doctor has died after being attacked at a walk-in clinic in Red Deer. A witness said the attacker was carrying a hammer and a machete. Then screams were heard coming from inside an examination room. Police arrived within minutes and arrested a man. The RCMP are investigating. Cabinet Minister Catherine McKenna has once again become the target of abuse, but this time it was one of her staffers who bore the brunt of it, a vulgar torrent unleashed by an angry man who went to McKenna's constituency office. Police are now investigating it as a hate crime. Ashley Burke looks at what's being done. She wears the mask to protect herself from COVID, but wants protection for her and her staff from abuse. It's unacceptable. I'm going to continue working uh, to stand against this, but I, I, it does have to stop. On Thursday, a man showed up here at McKenna's constituency office. He rang the doorbell, and when a female staff member opened the door and told him that he couldn't come inside and speak to the minister because of COVID-19, he then went on a tirade. Can I speak with Catherine? Profanities and threats filmed and posted online over the weekend, taking on a new life. I don't go to work every day and bust my...
for this to steal our money. You're all eggs. You're all pieces of. I think we need to hold social media platforms uh, to account. The video was circulated. Uh, it gave more voice uh, to whoever this person is uh, and to folks uh, that want to spread hate and want to intimidate folks. I worry about the rising tide of incitements to violence. Last year, Canada's former top public servant warned about exactly this. When people use terms like treason and traitor in open discourse, those are the words that lead to assassination. Hello, Mr. Last year, Justin Trudeau was seen wearing a bulletproof vest on the campaign trail over security threat. Last month, police arrested an armed man after he rammed his truck through the gates at Rideau Hall and made his way on foot towards Trudeau's house. As for McKenna, she's had to face public displays like this and says there are even more disturbing incidents happening to politicians privately. It is accelerating and I think that we've seen a lot of what's happened south of the border come up here and it is exacerbated by social media. She's increasing her security and says she's all for social media, but not this. Ashley Burke, CBC News, Ottawa. A Canadian who is at home on the world stage is once again playing a role in this country, and that has triggered some speculation. Mark Carney, the former governor of the Bank of Canada and the Bank of England, is now advising Justin Trudeau on how to revive and reshape the economy. Evan Dyer shows us why that has helped to revive the hopes of some Liberals who always saw him as a potential savior. I'm Canadian. I'm going to you know, come back to Canada and I look forward to, um, uh, to that day. Canada's prodigal child of finance has always had an interest in his own country's politics, though much of his career has played out abroad. One thread connects his past work and the role he now plays for Justin Trudeau's Liberals, the management of financial crises. Carney headed the Bank of Canada under the Harper government when the 2008 financial crisis hit and this country plunged deep into deficit. Look, there is a plan to restore confidence and growth in this uh, economy. Uh, we're implementing it. It's going to work. It did work, and that caught the eye of the world's oldest central bank. He's being described as a financial rock star. In 2013, Carney became governor of the Bank of England. Three, two, one. And soon faced a new crisis, Brexit. I am willing um, to do whatever else I can um, in order to promote both a smooth a smooth Brexit and an effective transition at the Bank of England. He wrapped up an extended seven-year term in March just as COVID hit the West, accepting a high-level post at the United Nations and now advising the Trudeau government. I think what this government is doing is uh, getting the most senior voices at the table to help navigate um, the economic crisis of our time that we find ourselves in. And it is not uncommon to have governments seek outside support. It, it, it's something that we want to ensure that Canada comes on top of. The Honourable Finance Minister. But it comes as Canada's current Minister of Finance, Bill Morneau, is facing calls to resign over the WE affair. Appointing a star advisor on finance could be seen as undercutting a finance minister who's already under pressure. Mark Carney's also been touted as a possible future leader of the Liberal Party. And with a Liberal seat opening up in Toronto, speculation abounds that this could be the moment he moves into his own country's politics. Evan Dyer, CBC News, Ottawa. And here's David Cochran from our Ottawa Bureau to give us a better handle on all this. So David, a whole lot of wishful talk today from the Liberals. Is there, is there any merit to any of this? Yeah, it's easy to see why the Liberals like Mark Carney so much. The financial credentials are obvious, but you know, he's also a UN advisor on climate change. He's writing a book now on income and social inequality. Big issues this government is thinking about for the post-COVID phase uh, of its mandate. And this, you know, he's long been seen as maybe a future prime minister or at worst a finance minister. And this comes at a time when the current finance minister is leaking oil all over the place and there's a seat open in York Centre. Now, the Liberals are strong in the 416 area code, but York Centre would be their weakest seat. A senior Liberal told me today that this is really a coin toss by-election, not the sort of place you want to run a star candidate. And on top of that, there's been no obvious signs from Mark Kearney that he's poised or ready to run. Now, the Liberals will build him an all-star team if he ever gave any kind of an indication that he wanted to do it, but to this point, it's just not there. So for all of those Liberals waiting with bated breath, Adrian, they don't want to hold their breath because they might be doing it for quite some time. Okay, something else to keep an eye on. Thanks, David. You got it. Thanks. Well, in this seemingly surreal COVID-19 pandemic, the world has now passed 20 million cases.
Here's a snapshot of how Canada fits in. With 385 new infections today, there are fewer than 5,000 active right now. To date, 120,000 Canadians have contracted COVID with more than 9,000 deaths. Ontario's daily count jumped above 100 for the first time in more than a week. The Windsor-Essex region is the last to be cleared for reopening in Stage 3. That's on Wednesday. And as Alison Northcott tells us, Quebec says kids will have to wear masks at school, but not in class. Three weeks before school, parent and teacher Juliette opong Nuacon is apprehensive. Sending my child to school with the possibility of him getting sick, it is a scary situation. I'm going to she wants to know there will be measures in place to keep kids safe. We are uh, right now updating our back-to-school plan. The Quebec government is trying to reassure parents. Wearing face covering will be mandatory for all students in elementary five and higher levels. That goes for teachers and staff too, but masks won't be required in the classroom, only in common areas. Instead of the original plan to group students in bubbles of six, the whole class will be a bubble. Students won't have to distance between classmates, but will have to distance from their teachers and students in other classes. Parents and teachers will be notified of any COVID-19 cases at their schools and children with medical conditions and a doctor's note can learn remotely. Some unions and associations representing teachers and principals say the plan adds clarity and removes the stress of enforcing smaller groups. There's a lot of stuff missing in this plan still and there's still a lot of questions. But this union president doesn't like the idea of packed classrooms with no masks. I'm really worried about that. Uh, as a high school teacher, knowing that classes can go up to 32, 34, 36 students in uh, fairly small rooms. With schools across Canada preparing to reopen, there are still a lot of unknowns, says this researcher. We don't really know what this virus looks like within the confines of a school over an extended period of time. Do I feel assured that the province is ready? I'm going to be very honest with you and say I don't know. Opong Nuakon says while she's still worried, she's preparing herself to deal with the potential risks. Alison Northcott, CBC News, Montreal. In the U.S., a school in Georgia where photos of unmasked crowding went viral is temporarily closing its doors. Six students and three staffers have tested positive for the coronavirus since a student shared these images. Classes have been switched to remote learning for Monday and Tuesday so the building can be disinfected. Meantime, Paul Hunter tells us there's yet another official reminder for people to protect themselves. It remains one of the most puzzling aspects of the COVID crisis in America. Even after all this time warning people to take extra care, today from the U.S. Surgeon General, this. I know there's a lot of people out there who feel like wearing one of these infringes upon their freedom. It's taking away their choice. Jerome Adams practically pleading with Americans to do the sensible, simple thing and wear a mask, please. I understand your concerns. Uh, I don't like people telling me what to do either. While many in this country do wear masks to slow the spread, countless perplexingly still do not. Just this weekend, more than 100,000 gathered for a motorcycle festival in South Dakota. Many were maskless. Officials fear the event will act as a super spreader. And in many parts of America, this is Indiana, students are now heading back to school. This even after a new report that nearly 100,000 children in America tested positive for COVID in just the last two weeks of July. Raising worries outside the classroom, this is Florida, the U.S. is putting school children needlessly at risk. I didn't see a lot of mask wearing. Um, and I think that that should have been something that was mandatory. Yeah, I think schools have to open. Today, Donald Trump was asked if all those positive tests for children gives him pause on that. He said he still believes children don't easily catch it. And if they do... But it's also a case where there's a tiny, it's a tiny fraction of uh, death tiny fraction and uh, they get better very quickly. Schools should reopen, he underlined, to kickstart the economy. Very important, he said, as Americans wonder where all of this goes from here. Paul Hunter, CBC News, Washington. 
And some tense moments in Washington this afternoon. Hopefully Sir, soon. Excuse me? The president abruptly ushered out of the briefing room and the White House placed on lockdown after the Secret Service shot an armed suspect just outside the complex. The person was rushed to hospital in serious condition. Trump returned minutes later saying things were under control. And we want to update you on another important story from the U.S. today. This evening, a Minnesota judge ordered the police video of George Floyd's death be made public. It's difficult to watch. It comes from the body cams of two of the officers involved. It's roughly an hour long, and it clearly shows the actions of Officer Derek Chauvin as he pressed his knee into George Floyd's neck while he was restrained, ignoring the audible pleas of, I can't breathe. The video is going to have wide-reaching impact and we're going to have more on this story tomorrow. Last week's massive Beirut explosion has already killed hundreds, injured thousands, and unleashed national fury. Now it's toppled the government. The prime minister says he and the entire cabinet are quitting. Margaret Evans explores this political aftershock. In the swirling cauldron of rage and grief that is Beirut, the Lebanese government's mass resignation was surely inevitable. Protesters pulling at barricades and blast walls protecting the parliament as if to dismantle the institutions of a state decried as corrupt with their bare hands. <laughs> The Prime Minister, Hassan Diab, announced the cabinet would step down late afternoon, saying the government had decided to follow the will of the people. But the people want the President, Michel Aoun, and the Parliament Speaker to go too. Many Lebanese hold the entire political class responsible for their country's current distress. An economic disaster born of a system spurning accountability and bred on nepotism and greed. Last week's explosion, more than 2,000 tons of ammonium nitrate allowed to sit in the middle of Beirut for years, despite warnings, is seen as an extension. And for those who lost loved ones, it is unforgivable. Najib and Sharbel Hitti and Sharbel Karam were cousins, all three proud firefighters. They feared nothing. They didn't feel the fire there. They, they were so brave. Antonella Hitti lost her brother, Najib. I blame everyone who knew what, what was inside uh, the place that the explosion happened. I blame the corruption of my government. But the government's resignation doesn't signal an end to Lebanon's trials. Far from it. Those on the streets trying to shift the country away from its old sectarian voting lines have tried before without success and new elections might simply shuffle the same old deck. Tonight, people will be cheering the resignations, but they'll also be bracing for the next stage of Lebanon's long struggle to leave its past behind. Margaret Evans, CBC News, London. Turning now to Hong Kong, where popular protest invites government wrath. Just days after the National spoke with billionaire pro-democracy activist Jimmy Lai, he's in a cell. Arrested in a massive show of force and a clear message that dissent will not be tolerated. And as Susana da Silva reports, his arrest likely won't be the last. Is there not a chance that, that you could be spirited away in the middle of the night to, to a, a prison in mainland China? Yes. But what can I do? Just keep quiet? Now he has no choice but to be quiet. Arrested by about 200 officers who marched him through the corridors of his pro-democracy newspaper in handcuffs, his staff looking on. This is the way for them to give a show to the Hong Kong people that if you dare to oppose the regime, then Jimmy Lai is the future of yours. Lai, his son, several other members of his company and another prominent pro-democracy activist were also arrested, charged under China's tough new national security law. Now is the most urgent situation in Hong Kong. I hope this is not the last video before I'm arrested in the upcoming future. 
On behalf of the United States, I The move brought global condemnation. U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo says it shows the Chinese Communist Party has eviscerated Hong Kong's freedoms. The arrests come on the same day China slapped counter sanctions on several U.S. members of Congress. If the international community would cooperate with each other, then maybe they can figure out a better way. The kind of a sanction launched by the U.S. government. The Canadian government says it supports the right of media everywhere to operate free from intimidation by state authorities, but a newly formed group says Canada needs to go further. We're facing a very uncertain future and we cannot guarantee Jimmy Lai's safety. And as well as there's no more rule of law, so I don't know how the judiciary system will proceed forward in Hong Kong, and certainly no due process. But whether any amount of international pressure will be enough to free Jimmy Lai is unclear. Susanna De Silva, CBC News, Vancouver. Anti-government demonstrators are not backing down in Belarus. Surprisingly effective opposition leader Svetlana Tikhanovskaya, who took over for her imprisoned husband, accuses the authoritarian president of blatant cheating in Sunday's landslide election win. Renee Filipponi is tracking that. It's an outcome many predicted, following an election widely seen as rigged. Thousands of people have been arrested as protests continue for a second day in Belarus. My son is 26 years old, this woman says. They arrested him just because I took a picture of a police car. They should have taken me. I'm not leaving till they bring my son back. Critics accuse Belarusian authorities of underhanded tactics, including voter suppression. According to a preliminary count, Alexander Lukashenko won the presidential election with more than 80 percent of the vote, extending his 26-year-long grip on power. He is calling protesters sheep. If you try to plunge the country into chaos and destabilize it, says Lukashenko, even with minor incidents, you will receive an instant response from me. Svetlana Tianoskaya was his main opposition. She drew massive crowds at rallies during the campaign. She says the election result completely contradicts common sense. The authorities are not listening to us, she says. They have completely separated themselves from the people. Even the reliable pollsters put him around 25 to 28 percent maximum of the vote. And that wouldn't have been enough to win in the first round. This is why 80 percent is so farcical. In a statement, the government of Canada said it's deeply concerned by the actions of the Belarusian authorities and that we call on the government of Belarus to exercise restraint and uphold respect for human rights. This Belarus expert says the protests will continue unless Lukashenko loses the support of the army. So it wouldn't surprise me if the army eventually would turn on Lukashenko, but I think that's the decisive moment. For now, angry protests continue. Renee Filipponi, CBC News, London. Well, at least one person was killed and several others injured after a gas explosion rocked a Baltimore neighborhood. You know, I'm thinking, God, because it could have been worse. The early morning blast leveled three homes and damaged a number of others in the area. An investigation is underway while crews are looking for anyone who may still be trapped in the rubble. And some really shocking video from a Toronto beach this weekend. Two men carrying chainsaws, one of them apparently covered in blood, intimidating onlookers Sunday morning. Later, they were arrested nearby. Police say they were involved in some kind of an earlier altercation where they suffered injuries, then left and returned with the weapons. No one was injured by the chainsaws. A new report shows black people are more likely to be arrested and charged by the Toronto police. For me, it's kind of like confirmation of something that I've been experiencing my whole life. Up next, shedding light on anti-black racism in the country's largest municipal police service. Plus, creating a COVID-free workplace. We call it a virus-free zone. So with the right protocols in place, uh, people can be screened on a regular basis. The new mobile rapid test that could change the game. And a moment she didn't see coming. I realized they were headed. We were directly in their path. Up close with killer whales, a BC swimmer shares her close encounter. We're back in two. More evidence today suggesting that being black 
means you're more likely to be treated worse by police. A report from the Ontario Human Rights Commission shows that in Toronto, black people are disproportionately arrested, charged, shot, and killed. Tashana Reed has more. The time for debate about whether systemic racism or anti-black racism exists is over. Today, a new report from Ontario's Human Rights Commission, reaffirming what so many in Toronto's black community say they experience at the hands of police. Black people are more likely to be charged, overcharged, and more likely to be arrested by Toronto police. The commission examined Toronto police data from 2013 to 2017. Although black people represent only 8.8% of the city population, black people were involved in 25% of all special investigation unit cases that resulted in death, serious injury or allegations of sexual assault and involved in 39% of cases where lower level force was used. The commission says the data disproves the myth that black people's interactions with police are because of their involvement with guns or gangs. Most of the use of force cases um, involved um, an unarmed civilian with no previous criminal record. Only one-fifth of charges resulted in conviction and were more likely to be withdrawn. That tells me that the police have less evidence to charge uh, those individuals and shouldn't be charging them in the first place. For members of the black community, the results did not come as a surprise. When you go through the experiences of being over-policed and surveilled and harassed and discriminated against, you, you don't have that trust and you don't have that last line of defense that you feel you can rely on. Black Lives Matter Toronto says there's enough research and not enough action. That it's actually the police that needs to be changed. It's actually the, the, the process of criminalization that needs to be changed. In a statement, Toronto police called the report vitally important and say that they have invested in training to fight systemic racism. Tashana Reed, CBC News, Toronto. Still ahead, how one employer is protecting his workers from COVID-19. It takes only one person. And it really, that's really the risk here. What a new rapid test could mean for your workplace. And later, the doctors are in on how big a problem it might be that most Canadians haven't been tested ever. Maybe you're among them. Back after this. As of tonight, more than four and a half million tests have been administered for COVID-19 in Canada, most in Ontario, Quebec and Alberta. And that rate of testing continues to steadily increase nationally. Now, tests are usually performed in, in hospitals or doctor's offices. But as businesses across the country try to safely resume operations, a new mobile test that can identify infected workers on the job is available and being used in Canada. Ioana Romiliotis explains what it is and how it works. In Ontario's far north, the start of a new day and a cautious return to normal. This is New Gold's silver and gold mine in Rainy River. COVID-19 never made it in here, and the plan is to keep it that way. It's not a matter of numbers, it's, it's a matter of zero is the bar. Renault Adams is New Gold's CEO, now working from his home in Oakville. That's the, that's the baseline. We are at zero and we want to stay there. As an essential service, the mine didn't completely shut down when the pandemic hit, but it did scale back. Now, as lockdown restrictions ease and hundreds more staff start to return, the risk of infection goes up too. So New Gold is taking COVID screening to a whole new level and putting workplace safety to the ultimate test. Back just a bit. Perfect. The company is the first in Canada to test employees for COVID on site. And that's it. With what could be an industry game changer. Because listen, here's the remarkable part. So we should have your results in about two hours or so. Okay. And we'll give you a call either way. <laughs> For me personally, I've always worked to see an outcome, to see something useful. So I'm driven by this and I could see that we could really help uh, people, organization and make that uh, difference, uh, literally uh, between uh, life and death. 
So this is the device. Mario uh, Thomas is the CEO of Precision Biomonitoring in Guelph. He says as a scientist, he felt a moral obligation to create this. As you see, there's no power cord. It runs on a battery. A mobile rapid COVID test designed to flag positive cases and isolate them in as close to real time as it gets. We call it a virus free zone. So with the right protocols in place, uh, people can be uh, uh, screened on a regular basis to ensure that even asymptomatic people who feel good and uh, can go to work, uh, they don't know they are infected. So with a proper screening program, we can uh, catch uh, this and ensure that uh, the site uh, remains virus free. So this, uh, the test is essentially a miniature mobile lab that can analyze nine samples at a time. For this afternoon, we're going to be going through the steps. On the other end of this call, the healthcare workers back in Rainy River. That can be done simultaneously for all the samples you're going to do in your runs. Amanda Naom is the co-founder of Precision Biomonitoring. She's training them on what to do with the swabs they've collected including how to actually take your sample from a swab and then take that through adding to our reagents, doing the RNA extraction, running the whole process and getting it set up, and then also importantly looking at the interpretation of the results. If that all sounds very sciencey, it is. But it comes down to a key component manufactured at this plant in Canada. Those tiny beads are reagents, or biomedical ingredients. They're freeze-dried to keep them stable while they're transported to a place like a mine. And here's the innovative part. A single bead includes the COVID test and the reagents needed to diagnose a patient sample. It's designed to target multiple parts of the virus and why it's guaranteed to be 98% accurate. For any organization that wants to bring large groups of people back, the appeal is huge. From mines to automakers and schools, hundreds of calls are pouring in. So is the thinking that most companies would use this daily, weekly? What's the, how often would they uh, test people? There's no fast answer to, to this. It depends on a number of factors, a number of uh, people, the, uh, risk factors. The basic answer that the baseline today is zero testing. So that's where we're starting from. So any testing in the, in the workplace uh, for the uh, for the virus itself, not taking the temperature, but really testing for the virus, is an improvement over the current situation. As for those first swabs collected in Rainy River. The results are back fast and they're all negative. And while this is just the start, the hope is that eventually every new crew gets tested at the beginning of a 14-day rotation. So that's the priority number one is your people. It's everything. If you don't have a healthy uh, workforce or a healthy community, uh, you can have the best mind in the world. It would never work, right? When you bring something new like this, you do it only for one reason, is what does that do? What does that move the needle? And because it's a lot of effort and a lot of time and uh, an engagement of a lot of people to do this. So you have to have a reason, a common reason to do it. It's too early to tell what difference the test will make here. There are already so many precautions, from regular disinfection of shared spaces like the cafeteria and keeping numbers low in sleeping quarters to allow for safe distancing. Some work is done in pairs, but this is an open pit mine and there are few close encounters. So why take the step further then, if you could manage the risk? Because it takes only one person. And it really, that's really the risk here. And uh, it would take one person to, to infect multiple others. And if we can do anything to catch that case on time and protect others, we'll do it. And while the pandemic unfolds, a quick test can mean one sure thing in the move towards what's still 
an uncertain future. Joanna Rumeliotis, CBC News, Toronto. And still ahead, more on what you need to know about COVID-19 testing. Does Canada have a testing blind spot? We'll ask our panel of doctors. And later, a look at the challenges facing BC fishermen. What this year's bad salmon run could mean for the future of the industry. Welcome back. Just before the break, we heard about a breakthrough in COVID testing in Canada. But consider where we're at today. Since the start of all of this, only about four and a half million COVID tests have been administered in this country. Now, maybe that sounds like a lot to you, but at most, if you think about it, that's just 12% of Canadians who have ever been tested. And it's probably even less than that because some of those tests are people who've gone back more than once to be retested. So as Canada's testing capacity opens up and as our schools and our workplaces open up, tonight we ask the question, does this country have a critical testing blind spot? Joining me now to discuss infectious diseases specialist Dr. Lenora Saxinger and epidemiologist Dr. Raywat Dionandan. Hello to the two of you. Dr. Dionandan, maybe I'm just going to start with a simple question to you. Do we need to do a better job of normalizing the idea of getting tested? Like, you know, I'm going to go to go to work, get my groceries, fill up the car, get tested, then make dinner. Okay, so until a vaccine is actually in our hands, testing is probably our number one tool for getting back to some semblance of normal. So we have, you must embrace testing, it must be part of our lives. Now the question is, must we spend public health dollars on normalizing it? I don't think so. We just need to put tests in a lot more places in society and it will become normalized for us. So in schools, in places like long-term care centers, in any place where you're going to encounter a lot of people. Dr. Saxinger, your take on that? I think that testing has a really crucial role because we, we know that some people can spread when they have either minimal symptoms or have not yet developed symptoms. And so identifying those individuals who are at risk of spreading to others is important. Um, and, you know, it, it, the other piece, I guess, is stigmatization. I think that there's a little bit of a um, different feelings around having a positive test right now. And I think that it just has to be part of the landscape. It really does that people get tested. Some people have very minimal symptoms and nuisance symptoms. Other people get very sick. But what is the, the, the caveat or, or maybe the, the caution in interpreting test results? I mean, both if you get a negative result, I mean, false sense of security or, or even a positive result, Dr. Saxinger. Well, I think it's important to know that if you have a negative test, um, that that counts for now and that there is a slight risk that you might have infection that was not captured by that test. Um, testing in, depending on where the site is, so like throat versus nose versus nasopharyngeal, testing is 80 to 95% sensitive in most hands, but no test is perfect. Um, so you could miss something. And the other thing is that it only counts for now. So if you could become test positive tomorrow if you're negative today, and so you shouldn't really wear it as a shield. You should just take it as a momentary reassurance, I think. Um, and the other part to know is that if you test positive, that could reflect a prior infection. So if you had an illness in the last four to six weeks even, you could still test positive now. Um, and that's important to know because you're not super likely to transmit infection if you had a prior illness and now you're recovered but still um, basically having viral fragments that are detectable. Mm. Um, and the other thing is, of course, if you have a test positive now when you feel completely fine, you still could also develop symptoms in the next little while. And that would be a much higher risk scenario from the point of view of an active infection that can transmit to others. Dr. Dionanen, if, if we generally agree that, that like, more testing is, is generally a good thing, what's the bottleneck now? I mean, is it, is it capacity? Is it, is it access? Or, or, or is it just convincing people to go? get tested. All of the above. It depends on where you are in the country. In some parts of the country, the remote areas, there aren't enough test kits, not enough swabs. Uh, sometimes there aren't enough well-trained uh, human resources people to conduct the test effectively. Sometimes there isn't sufficient lab capacity to do rapid testing to get it back in a reasonable time, like two or three days. And very often now, especially in denser urban areas, there isn't the desire for people to get tested. They see it as a bit of a hassle to line up for hours on end. So we need to approach these, these bottlenecks on all fronts and really increase our capacity across the board. Last Last word to you, Dr. Saxinger, um, maybe a controversial idea, mandatory testing. What do you think? I think um, that, that's interesting. I think that I would only foresee people even pondering that in settings that are quite closed and quite high risk. So for example, say employees at a long-term care center or employees that have to work closely together in essential services. 
I actually don't think it's highly likely that we would need to make testing mandatory. I think it's more likely that we have to make testing easy. Uh, I don't think people object to the testing per se, but they might object to the processes that they have to go through to get testing. So I, I'm, I'm not seeing that as being a, a big debate in the future. I think we're just going to be looking to make testing easier and um, more convenient and uh, more, more limber, basically. Mm. Doctors, always excellent to hear from you. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you. Thank you. When we come back, why BC fishermen can't catch a break. How this year's bad salmon run is forcing some to adapt. Next. Salmon stocks have been down along parts of the West Coast, and that's meant a bad year for British Columbian commercial salmon fishers. Tomorrow, the Commons Standing Committee on Fisheries and Oceans is looking into the state of Pacific salmon, the latest in a series of meetings to look at the management and the future of the fishery. Greg Rasmussen has more on the fishers' plight and how some are planning to change what they catch. Instead of fishing, many boats are tied up, with owners left with just memories of what it was like on board when salmon runs were strong. But times change, and I mean, you sit around and complain. Or you go BC's to most important and, uh, salmon river, the Fraser, is having a bad year, a big hit for those who fish in southern BC. I don't think there's going to be a commercial salmon fishery, maybe in the fall, but not, not in the summer. There have been some good years, but McDonald says the overall trend is down, and he blames the federal government's management of the salmon fishery. I have zero faith. <laughs> they are doing a terrible job, and it all comes down to politics before science. And it used to be the other way around. Further north, some are catching salmon, despite a late start to the season. Yeah, we're just going into Port Ed to offload our fish. It makes it uh, um, even more uh, challenging than would typically be the case. It's not a big year in terms of fishing, and because of uh, COVID-19, we don't know uh, what kind of uh, prices our, fi our fish will fetch in the market. He says many in the fleet are waiting for details of the federal government's promised $500 million aid package for fisheries across the country. Two and a half pounds of chum. With fewer salmon, this direct-to-consumer co-op is trying to get people to think about other species, prawns, halibut, maybe even some hake. Got spot prawns. Oh, nice. Salmon isn't all that comes out of the water here, and it, you can't always count on huge amounts, and we encourage people to eat, uh, as we like to say, with the ecosystem. If there's a lot of one thing, you know, maybe we should be eating that and back off others. It's taking time, but fish eating habits are changing, and some of those who don't want to stay tied to the dock are out chasing fish other than salmon. Greg Rasmussen, CBC News, Vancouver. When we come back, a memorable weekend swim. How this close encounter with a pot of orcas near Vancouver came to be. That's next in our moment. So Debbie Collingwood was going for a swim near Vancouver this weekend when she got the experience of a lifetime. The long distance swimmer along with her friends who were kayaking came across a pod of orcas and the whales were coming right towards them. And that is our moment. Well, I was just finishing up a three hour um, training swim and I saw my kayaker sort of pointing across the bay and I thought he meant we were going to go across and then back in. But what he was pointing at was whales. <laughs> we didn't know which direction they were going or what they were doing. It's quite rare for them to be in Bachelor Bay. I alerted Deb to stop and she came over and grabbed my kayak. Are you kidding me? Wow. In the moment, I was I was scared. There was definitely some some fear. Being in the water is definitely a different feeling than than being, you know, on the water. I've been close before, not that close, not even that close in a kayak. The whole thing was just surreal. Like the world kind of stops for a second. It was really cool. <laughs> okay, they are so calm about everything that happens. So in the moment, I was a bit scared. She says she also <laughs> slipped in there that she was going. Debbie was going on a three-hour training swim, which made me say, <laughs> "Wait, wait, wait, yeah. pardon." Uh, she is apparently training to swim the English Channel, which is no easy feat. Yeah, I, yeah, I get tired 
three hours sitting at my desk. Yeah, it is it. exhausting. But, and, and there's something about being in the open water, right? Like, like, and I'm not a strong swimmer to begin with, so even, even a pool freaks me out a little bit. But the thought, I don't know, you can't see the bottom. You, you, I know. I don't know how they do it. That's The National for this August 10th. Have a good night. Good night.